we're continuing our Z690 motherboard coverage. This is a Z690 Gaming X DDR4. We're going to do a build with it, and we're also going to talk about an efficiency power anomaly that's happening on Z690. So even if you're not interested in the motherboard, you can learn something because Z690's got some really interesting properties to it when we talk about power utilization and testing with high-end GPUs like the 3090 and the 6900 XT. Let's dive in. All right, first up, let's talk about the motherboard. This is the Z690 Gaming X DDR4 from Gigabyte. This is meant to be a relatively affordable option that can satisfy and tame the super power thirsty 12900K. And with the 690, I think one of the more important features of the motherboard is going to be VRM and power delivery because at the lower end, I don't think some of the Z690 motherboards are gonna be able to fully unlock the 12900K, but that might not actually be the whole story. It might just be that some combinations of things actually cause the system to use more power and it doesn't really hurt efficiency. Needless to say, Gigabyte advertises this as a 16 V-Core phase, one VCC GT phase, two VCC aux phases, and 60 amp power stages with tantalum polymer capacitors. This is also a Gigabyte branded motherboard. The Aorus branded motherboards tend to be higher end and more gaming oriented and that kind of thing, but I picked this motherboard out because I was spending my own money, and this is the one that I thought was a pretty good mix of features. Now DDR4, there's the Gaming X and there's the Gaming X DDR4. With Alder Lake with LGA 1700, you have to pick the motherboard to support whatever kind of memory you want to support. So this is a Z690 Gaming X DDR4. I picked that because it's DDR4, because DDR4 is cheaper, and right now there's not really a lot of speed difference between good DDR4 and the DDR5 that's currently available on the market. That won't always be true. Eventually they'll be really fast and affordable DDR5, but that day, it's not today. So in terms of motherboard support, the manual advertises support for up to DDR4 3200. Now if you're like me and you like to go download the manual for the motherboard before you look at it, and you download the motherboard manual for this motherboard, it will literally have DDR4 and 5 specifications in it. Don't let that confuse you. If you pick up the DDR4 motherboard, only DDR4 will work in this motherboard. There is another version of this motherboard that is the Z690 Gaming X, and that is a DDR5 motherboard, and it's the same manual for DDR4 and DDR5. Don't be confused. This motherboard locks you into DDR4. The other version of the motherboard locks you into DDR5. Very important. Now, I was a little off put that the DDR4 support was only labeled up to 3200 on this motherboard because usually there's, you know, they go wild with the DDR4 specifications and they have a lot of other stuff in there that's along the lines of something like, oh yes, we tested up to 3800 or 4400 or whatever. So I got out the Crucial Ballistics DDR4 4000 kit to use with this motherboard to see how that stacked up. It worked fine. Also got out my OLOY. Uh, 3600 kit that was 128 gig, which by the way is the maximum that this platform is going to support, whether it's DDR4 or 5, and that also worked at 3200, so that was pretty good. 3600 was a little sketchy, not perfectly stable, and I did raise the voltage, so maybe if you're running full memory density configuration on DDR4, 128 gig might be a problem. Gaming with some games, it can make a little bit of a difference, but really almost all of the differences between DDR4 and 5 are inconsequential and unless you specifically know something about your oddball use case you shouldn't really worry too much about ddr4 versus ddr5 now i mean if you can spend the extra bucks and it's not a big deal to you then yeah by all means go ahead and do that but it's not going to dramatically improve your computing experience or anything like that if you're going to be rocking the integrated gpu with no add-in gpu for a little while because of the shortages and, and other problems ddr5 does help gaming a little bit but it's on the order of like 5% best case scenario. And I've got another video comparing Intel's iGPU offering on the i5 with what you can get for about $300 from Team Red. It ain't pretty. So um, maybe check that out if you're interested in iGPU gaming. You might change your mind. All right, let's take a look at board layout because Gigabyte's done something interesting there too. We have a single PCI Express 5.0 slot and that is wired directly into the CPU. That is all 16 lanes. That is the only option. There is a BIOS option to bifurcate this slot into by 8x8 if you have a PCI Express 5.0 riser card that gives you two by 8 slots, but don't, no, that's just, 
it's, it's not an option. There's two more physical by 16 slots at the bottom edge of the motherboard. Those are actually both by four electrical and they're connected to the chipset. One of the really amazing and magical things about Z690 this time around is there is actually a ton of PCI Express bandwidth. For once, I have no complaints. We've got 16 lanes of PCI Express 5. That's actually all wired into this primary white GPU slot. And then we have the DMI 4.0 interface, which is the equivalent of eight PCI Express 4.0 lanes. That's 16 gigabytes per second to the chipset. And then the chipset provides additional PCI Express 3 and 4 lanes, plus a whole bunch of other peripherals. But the interface from the chipset to the CPU is 16 gigabytes per second, plus the PCI Express 5 lanes, plus we've got four more NVMe lanes from uh, the top NVMe slot just below the CPU to the CPU. So that's 16 plus eight plus four PCI Express lanes on this platform, or at least PCI Express lanes worth of bandwidth. That's more than main memory bandwidth. How bananas is that? So I've got no complaints about that. Gigabyte has used almost all of that for M.2 connectivity. So we've got our primary PCI Express 4 M.2 that's connected directly to the CPU. And then we have three more below the GPU that are connected to the chipset. It'll support up to 110 millimeter M.2s. And yes, we set up RAID. You can do RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 10. It doesn't require a VROC module. There's no kind of shenanigans about license unlock or anything like that as we've seen on past platforms. If you've seen some of our past videos, you know that you know, we and everybody else basically struggled with that and basically wrote off VROC as a really promising, well-engineered technology that was encumbered by um, marketing mistakes. That seems to have been corrected and I was able to use a bunch of uh, Keoxia, you know, little tiny BGA Keoxia M.2, as well as some Samsung 963s. It's basically opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of uh, performance um, to see what this platform was capable of. Now those Keoxia M.2, they're some of the very few M.2 that work really well in portable devices because they're so low power. But at the really high end, if you want PCI Express 4.0 and an ultra low latency, you know, there's Samsung 980s, Samsung 963 if you're in the commercial space. There's a lot of options for M.2. Running a RAID 0 M.2 on this was a delightful experience and setting that up, you gotta enable some BIOS options reboot. You got some hoops you gotta jump through. There's another video on that, you can check that out. Let's take a look at the rear I.O. The rear I.O. on this motherboard is maybe a little unusual, but I get why Gigabyte did what they did and save on cost. Let's take a look. We've got four USB 2 ports. This is meant for your low speed peripherals. Everybody still has a bunch of USB 2 ports. I don't really see this as a big deal. A lot of motherboards, you know, like we got 20 5 gigabit ports. Do you, do you really have that many 5 gigabit devices? I mean, really? Because, you know, a mouse running at 5 or 10 gigabit doesn't really help you. And then we got two 10 gigabit Type A ports. Those are USB 3.2, is what they're labeled. One of those is for BIOS flashback. If we got a display port and an HDMI out, those are for your iGPU on your Intel non-F series CPU because the F series doesn't include a GPU. Our Type-C port at the back here is a 2x2 two two 20 gigabit per second port and then our other connections are 5 gigabits per second USB 3.2. And then we've got our Realtek ALC 1220 audio codec. The premium audio codec from last gen is the, the mid-range of this generation. We've only got the two analog outputs plus an optical SPDIF, so that's cut down a little bit, but we do still have our uh, front panel audio connections, so you can use that since the outputs are programmable and still run a 5.1 setup if you really want to. In terms of other connectors on the motherboard, we've got an 8-pin and a 4-pin for CPU power. We've got CPU fan and CPU optional 4-pin headers at the top. We've got a digital and a 50-50 analog RGB header. Our standard 24-pin ATX power connector. Things are a little different with USB 4 and Thunderbolt on this generation of boards, so the headers are a little different, but we do have that option on this motherboard. Stay tuned for more information about Thunderbolt 4 peripherals and that kind of thing. Uh, we have our six SATA interfaces. These are all six gigabit per second SATA interfaces. And some of those share resources. Then at the bottom edge of the motherboard, we've got our front panel connection, our CMOS reset header, four four pin fan headers, our USB flash button. So if you need to flash this thing, if you need to reflash the BIOS from like a USB stick, you gotta use the indicated USB port on the back, plus you gotta hit this little button on the motherboard so that it will start flashing the BIOS while the system is off in order to you know, update it for an unsupported CPU or whatever. Then we've got two USB 2.0 headers. Those are for you know peripherals. All the more water pumps and things like that have an optional USB header. Uh, you'll see that in our build that we do. So this is kind of nice that you can connect USB 2 peripherals internally. 
Then we've got our header for the new serial peripheral interface TPM for an enhanced TPM header should we need it. Although it's got onboard TPM, so it's gonna do Windows 11 right out of the box. Then we've got two more RGB headers, one digital, one 50-50. And finally, our front panel audio connections. And yes, this does have gigabytes uh, audio amp up solution. Although the measured signal to noise ratio wasn't really anything to write home about at about 119 dB. So not terrible, but you know, there there's better. The rear of the motherboard is nothing special. There's no extra heat sinks or IO shields or anything like that. And the screw placement is a pretty standard ATX layout. So all in all, it's a pretty vanilla bog standard motherboard. Now for the build, I'm retrofitting an older fractal meshify case. I love these cases because there are a lot of airflow and you get a system like this, you're going to overclock and really juice it to the max. This thing's probably going to pull between seven and 850 watts. That's a lot of heat generation. So the meshify is a pretty good choice getting this slotted in for that system. I'm also using the new Fractal AIO. This is not an Asetek based design. This is something special from Fractal, but it's one of the coolers that I had that had an LGA 1700 mounting kit. Now, a lot of your existing coolers will be compatible with LGA 1700, but the mounting pressure is different. So you need to contact your cooler manufacturer if you're upgrading from something that you already have to ask if they have an LGA 1700 kit. If they do, that'll make your existing cooler compatible with the uh, socket that's used here. Just because it physically fits doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work. There are some older all-in-ones and some older tower coolers that will work on the new socket physically, but they need to adjust a couple of things in the mount to get the mounting pressure just right. So if you can, definitely use the kit from the manufacturer instead of just trying to DIY it because the CPU may not be cooled properly. And at this wattage, that's dangerous. For cooling, look, it's the Fractal Lumen. It'll look pretty good through the mesh on the front of this uh, Fractal Meshify case. This is the older Meshify. The newer ones are nicer. Now, what's probably in retail at the time of this video is not compatible with LGA 1700, but Fractal has a free kit that you can get on their website. But the global situation being what it is, logistics might be a little difficult. If you see one of these in retail or on an online store, look specifically in the product description for LGA 1700 compatibility. Otherwise you're gonna be waiting for that LGA 1700 compatibility kit. Now for our anomaly testing, gonna need more than one system. This is our DDR4 system. And spoiler alert, I've already done the comparison. We're gonna put that in another video. You've actually got two videos you gotta look for. First is the results of the build. How is the performance? Did I encounter anything weird? No, everything was basically working as expected. In fact, if anything, the performance difference between this DDR4 test system based around our Gigabyte Z690 Gaming X DDR4 versus our comparison system with DDR5, which you've probably already seen the video for, it's another system based around the ASRock Tai Chi, there's not a lot of performance delta in those systems for compiling, for productivity, for pretty much everything except 1080p gaming. And the differences between 1080p gaming is marginal at best, only with the highest end GPUs. But the power utilization, the power utilization is something interesting. I'm still working on that, so you're gonna have to stay tuned for that for another video. Oh, and in case you're wondering about Alder Lake and testing Alder Lake on Linux with uh, the Gigabyte Z690, Linux does actually work really well, but Alder Lake in general right now struggling a little bit with its scheduler on Linux. The very latest update on that is they withdrew cluster scheduling in the kernel if it detects a hybrid CPU, which is an indirect correction for a different situation that has to do with ACPI tables and figuring out which cores are the preferred cores as far as the, as far as the scheduler goes when XMP is turned on. And the behavior for that is different on different motherboards. This one is mostly good, although there was one scenario where I had enabled XMP and I got the bad behavior where it doesn't actually tell you which core is good. Most of the time, it did actually report the correct cores with XMP enabled. And of course, if you disable XMP, which is crazy and you shouldn't do that probably, um, it was reporting the correct cores. So I really wish that Alder Lake supported unregistered error correcting memory, but it doesn't. So there we are. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick look at the Z690 Gaming X DDR4 and our fractal test system that it's going into in order to investigate why when you use a different GPU, the CPU uses less power, even accounting for everything else.
check out Igor's lab, I think beat me to the punch on this. Check out their article on that in the interim. But uh, there's a couple undiscovered nuggets here, or there's a couple nuggets that I'm sort of still tripping over. So this is our first test system of two, probably about two videos away from a conclusion. I gotta new, do another build. And uh, yeah, look for that. I'm one of this level one, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. Woo, Z69 Gaming X. Alder Lake is weird, but cool. Thank you.